The force of inertia is known in mechanics, but until only recently, it had been considered too weak and difficult to harness for propulsion. According to some theorists, like Hal Puthoff, inertia, like gravity, is what occurs when we try to accelerate an object against the zero-point fluctuations in the vacuum. We run into resistance, literally. Canadian inventor Roy Thunson has developed an inertial impulse propulsion engine which overcomes that resistance using centrifugal force. It pushes against nothing and emits no exhaust, but it's been calculated to be 20 times more efficient than a jet engine. Here, the Thornson inertial propulsion drive powers a canoe in a swimming pool. The motor, which is housed in a box, never contacts the water or air. In the pendulum test, unidirectional force is being generated to keep the pendulum to one side. Whether or not uh, we can demonstrate, as I have, with engineering analysis and um, and models that will climb and incline will pass a, a pendulum test, in other words, stay on one side of the pendulum consistently, and even power a canoe in a swimming pool. Commercialization of that device is still a, a very difficult road. And we see that in many inventions. But what I like to emphasize is my F over P uh, measurement of that is literally 20 times better than the jet engine. A jet engine, typically a commercial jet engine, um, the DC-9, I think, is the one that I analyzed, has about 0.016 newtons per watt. And then the, this is in the metric system. Now, when we look at the Thornson, he's able to achieve 0 0.3, 0 0.32 newtons per watt, literally 20 times better than the uh, jet engine. Roy Thornson is developing refinements to his system to increase its performance. Unfortunately, like many inventors, even with a U.S. patent in hand, he has yet to find sufficient investment capital to bring his motor to the marketplace. Propulsion force does in fact exist. We've all seen these little toy gizmos that demonstrate lightning in a bottle. It's the electric phenomenon called plasma discharge. Various inventors, working independently, are coming up with some exotic combinations of gases, metals, and processes to actually squeeze excess electrical energy out of this phenomenon of nature. In 1996, Paolo and Alexandra Correa received the first patent for such a device called the Pulsed Abnormal Glow Discharge Reactor, the first of its kind to convert plasma discharge directly into electricity. This is a standard. Utah inventor Paul Pantone has developed what he calls the GEET fuel processor, a plasma generator similar to a super carburetor that actually appears to run on 80% water and is entirely non-polluting. This device replaces the carburetor and exhaust and combines them as one unit, whereas this end of it acts as a miniature refinery allowing the engine to run on everything from battery acid and water mixed to crude oil right out of the ground. This is Angola crude, 39.5 gravity. The exhaust coming down goes around and comes out here at the far end. The center chamber draws some of the heat from the exhaust, plus this tube takes some of the exhaust gases, takes them up into the chamber, and bubbles them down to the bottom. The bubbles, as it comes through the fuel, are brought up to the top of the chamber, picked up through a tube, and fed up the center of the exhaust pipe. 
While they're being fed up the exhaust pipe, they are in a vacuum, and there's a heat exchange which occurs. This process has been argument, argued a few times uh, to be either a plasma field, an electro field. We do know that it does have a slight radiation, which is not alpha, beta, or gamma, and we do have x-rays to show that whatever is coming from the unit does get affected different from stainless steel than uh, the regular steel. Yep. When the temperature of the exhaust is the same as the air temperature going in from the air portion up here, normally one, three percent more oxygen coming out of the tailpipe than there is in the air we're breathing. And no carbon at all. Carbon vanishes. I wouldn't say vanishes. I would say transmuted into some other substance, a lighter element, because we have an abundance of lighter elements here that are not explained from down here. But during the heat process, uh, there are molecular changes. After running this engine from 1983 until now, and many times we had it running eight, eight, eight and a half hours a day, uh, we have never had to change the spark plug, change the oil, or clean it. We have taken the head off three times to inspect the inside of it, and it's been spotless. What we have here is the Pantone GEAT device fitted to a Ford 2300cc four-cylinder engine. As you can see, we, had, we have a, a see-through container here, which holds the fuel. As the engine is started, air is drawn in by vacuum through the fuel and bubbles the fuel, the vapors of which are drawn off here. They travel down this hose into our reaction chamber. They go up the reaction chamber and return back out here to be, intake, to be taken into the engine through this tube. This is our air filter. And this tube is connected to another valve, which are controlled by this linkage, operating the air intake and the fuel intake. This is the valve that controls the return air going through this tube into the bummer. During the testing with the 2300cc fitter, we have achieved efficiency up to and including 300% of normal. Uh, if this uh, engine normally got 20 miles to the gallon on the highway, uh, you'd now be looking at 60. Uh, our load tests and whatnot have not been completed, but we feel very confident that there's not going to be a, a power problem out there that wasn't in I the witnessed air. the uh, demonstrations so the by process, uh, uh, Paul Pantone, and I was astonished by the claim uh, of abil ability to use any uh, fuel or water, including mixed with oil and so forth. It's similar to something that's validated already by Gunnerman uh, that's uh, being used in the state of Nevada at the moment. Uh, however, uh, this is an even more shocking claim uh, because it appears that it is truly, if it's correct and if it can be validated, he seems quite open, uh, it appears that this may be yet another process which, uh, which does some kind of transmutation of elements. He claims there's no carbon coming out of the exhaust, which is, would be unthinkable for putting a, a hydrocarbon fuel in, even if it's mixed with water. You have to get carbon out. And, and he's claiming that there are no 
uh, CO or CO2 emissions from this, and there appear to be none visually, uh, that, that is, there appear to be no soot of particles coming out of the exhaust. So I hold out some hopes for this. So our demonstration units that will be going out to about 25,000 stations between now and the end of the year or early next year are being retrofit as we speak now to include our system in the exhaust pipe and our injector body here with standard equipment that normally is supplied from the factory so that we can get it out to the public as quickly as possible. Hopefully After being rejected by we'll dozens of U.S. manufacturers, Pantone now has contracts with several major foreign countries. Recently, several U.S. companies have decided to take a second look. In 1989, two physicists from the University of Utah, Dr. Stanley Pons and Dr. Martin Fleshman, created a media frenzy with their announcement of cold fusion in a bottle. Although several independent experiments reported similar test results, the cry of fraud quickly went up at MIT and other prestigious universities. The debunking was swift and merciless. Throughout the history of science, any time there is something that is very threatening to the established ideas, such as Galileo's revelations through the telescope and his idea of following on others that the Earth goes around the sun, not vice versa, continental drift, uh, all sorts of claims that ultimately became validated, the initial reaction of science is to say this is nonsense and to reject it and not even to look at the data. And I would say that the cold fusion and free energy or new energy phenomena are so threatening to the undermining's uh, underpinnings of of modern physics and chemistry and all other sciences that you, you would get the you get the expected intensely negative reaction. The real story about cold fusion is that it never died. Soon after the announcement in Utah on March 23, 1989. Uh, Hundreds, thousands of people all over the world, scientists and engineers, began to try, <clears throat> they began to try to replicate the Pons and Fleischmann experiment. And positive results kept coming in uh, of all manner, uh, including the energy, the excess energy, far more out than in than could be possibly explained by any chemical reaction or any previously stored energy. The unfortunate situation was that the U.S. Department of Energy masterminded a, a bogus panel of so-called experts, who many of whom were biased from the start against the subject. They came up with the expected answer with only, with, within three months, and they ratified it within six months, even as the evidence continued. Those physicists, nuclear physicists that had been working with hot fusion, the tokamaks, this type of thing. They have a monstrous amount of evidence that shows exactly what they expect to have happen with nuclear reactions in this hot gas plasma. They believe, and it's a good, a good first guess, that the nuclear reactions that would occur in a cold fusion cell should be the same. Well, Mother Nature doesn't always accept our predispositions to, to belief. Therefore, Mother Nature says, this is a different environment. These are different reactions. And hey guys, start studying a little harder and find out what's going on. The problems that occur in evaluating a cold fusion device have not been so much does it work, but does it work every time? And many, uh, many scientists are of the opinion that if it doesn't work every time, then there's something wrong. Uh, basically, the problem has been in the preparation of the metal. Now this is particularly true in the heavy water experiments of Pons and Fleischmann. Certain materials will just absolutely uh, close off the effect of the cells. Other things that are finding additions will promote the effect. So there's a lot of study going on in that area. So over 200 laboratories in over 30 countries have replicated or advanced or, or, or had successes in various types of cold fusion devices.